Good morning again. Happy Sabbath. Let's pray. Kind and merciful Heavenly Father, we are thankful to be in your presence. We're thankful to be celebrating another Sabbath with you and with one another. Lord, as we come before you, sinful beings, Lord, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins. Lord, I ask that you would cleanse me this morning, that you speak through me, that your words might reach to the ears and the hearts of your children, Lord, and that they might receive something today that would draw them closer to you. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Is it sure? Okay. So welcome again to our Religious Liberty Sabbath. Annually, we celebrate something that is important to any person that loves freedom. It's important to our worldwide denomination. And we make a special emphasis every year to bring to our remembrance the importance of religious liberty. What you see on the screen is, is the, the, the campaign for this year. And a reminder that the offering that's collected today will go towards the religious, religious liberty efforts of our worldwide church. Your gift matters. We are, as a member of the Georgia Cumberland Conference, we are part of the Southern Union Division. And they have a organization, a department that supports all the religious liberty efforts on behalf of the church, as well as the members. If you were here and you saw the little video that was played, uh, you saw the, the lady that had some struggles with employment. Um, if you have Sabbath, Sabbath accommodation issues, you need assistance with anything, your church is here to offer you assistance. Along with those accommodation assistance, like we mentioned, we make sure the Liberty Magazine gets into the hands of those thought leaders, those decision makers in governments um, that make a difference so that we can make sure to preserve the liberty that we enjoy today. It's important. There you see some of the other additional um, services provided by the Southern Union Division. Some of you have seen Amira Al Haddad before. She's been here many times. She continues to provide um, services as director for the Southern Union. And again, these are people that are part of our church. If you need any assistance, feel free to reach out to me as the local representative here in the church. Or if you need to reach out further, um, they're here to serve you. I titled the sermon this morning, The Importance of Religious Liberty. Something, it's probably something that we don't think about always, but know that there's somebody, there's someone always out there on that wall making sure that your liberty is protected. Because when we lose it, you're gonna feel it. And throughout our history, throughout the, the, the time of our denomination, a special emphasis, as I mentioned before, has always been made to protect religious liberty. Now, growing up as a child, I was often, as many other of my peers, inside the church, but with my eyes looking out through the window, and we were like, the church I went to, we were right on the street. So you could hear everybody walking by, laughing and having fun. And I was inside the walls. For some, some of us, religious liberty comes across as freedom from religion. But that's not what it is. We celebrate, now we get to go outside those walls and no longer be shackled by religion, no longer be shackled by the do's and the don'ts. And we think to ourselves, now we're free. 
Now I have no more restrictions. Now my life can be enjoyed. I could tell you as a person that thought that way in my youth, and you see I have gray hairs now. Escaping the word of God does not bring you freedom. It does not bring you liberty. It does not bring you joy. But that's what the devil tries to tell us. That's what the devil tries to put in our hearts. And I hope what I share today will help you to understand that there is no religious liberty without the word of God. Why is religious liberty important? Like I said, we celebrate freedom from religion, but going back into the history of our country, we have people braving the treacherous seas to make a, a journey over here to a country hoping to have an environment that they can have freedom to worship as they please. Many died. The environment that they left was just so bad that they decided to, to brave the seas, brave the unknown to try to preserve liberty. We all know the famous quote from Patrick Henry, give me liberty, what is he saying? Liberty is more important than my very life. And the thing that we sit here today, there were people, there were individuals that preceded us, that saw the value of liberty and decided to fight for it so that you can sit in a pew this morning free to worship, free to share your beliefs. But as we see, some of those freedoms are being eroded. We captured some in, the, in our laws and our constitution to guarantee this freedom. And like I mentioned, some of this is being eroded. During our Wednesday night prayer, prayer meetings, we are reading the book, The Great Controversy. And one of the chapters in The Great Controversy talks about this man called John Wycliffe referred to in history as the morning star of what? The Reformation. The Reformation we all know was an important time in the history of the Christian church in the world, really. Because it highlighted a, a call back to the word of God. The period that he lived in, he was in the 14th century. The period that he lived in, we all call the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages was dark because the word of God was suppressed. The word of God was suppressed by the very people who were supposed to be uplifting the word of God. He was an English scholar and a theologian. Let me see if I can get it. Before the Reformation, there were times, there were at times, but very few copies of the Bible in existence. But God had not suffered his word to be wholly destroyed. Its truths were never, were not to be forever hidden. In the different countries of Europe, men were moved by what? The spirit of God to search for the truth as for hid treasures. Providentially guided to the Holy Spirit, the scriptures, they studied the sacred scriptures with intense interest. They were willing to accept the light at any cost to themselves. Though they did not see all things clearly, they were enabled to perceive many long buried truths. As heaven sent messengers, they went forth 
rending asunder the chains of error, superstition, and calling upon those who had been so long enslaved to arise and assert their God-given liberty. The word of God was kept locked up, we're told in languages that were available, accessible only to the learned. It's amazing to me, it was considered heretical or heresy for the people that were deemed unlearned to have possession of the scriptures. This was from the church. It was even dangerous because they thought an unlearned might just misinterpret the scriptures so badly that they do, they do severe harm. John Wycliffe was a well-educated man. He was educated at Oxford in England. And that God used that to gain him access to the scriptures. God thus preparing the way for his future work as a reformer. And as he spent time in the word, we're told that he saw in it the plan of salvation revealed and Christ set forth as the only advocate for man. And so he gave himself into the service of Christ and determined to proclaim the truths he discovered. If I can get somebody uh, to assist me, uh, I'm missing one of my sons. Please get him back inside the church. Here's a quote from John Wycliffe. Christ and his apostles taught the people in the languages best known to them. It is certain that the truth of the Christian faith becomes more evident what? The more the faith is known. Therefore, he says, the doctrine should not be only in Latin, but in the common tongue, accessible to the people. This is what John thought. His opposition on the other end says, and so the gospel pearl, this thing of value, is thrown before that's what they're saying you are, swine, and trodden on the foot, and that which used to be so dear to both clergy and laity has become a joke. And this precious gem of the clergy has been turned into the sport of the common people. The word of God. John chapter 11, 46 to 48 brings a reminder of the attitude that they had here, the same attitude Jesus faced by the religious leaders of his day, just after having resurrected Lazarus. The people seeing in him, in Jesus, the hand of God, God visitation to Israel. They could only say, then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and says, what do we? For this man doeth many miracles. And if we leave him alone, brothers and sisters, all men will, what? We don't want that, do we? If we leave him alone to heal the brokenhearted, to bring sight to the blind, to bring life to the dead, all men will believe on him and the God that sent him. And we don't what? want that. Because if that happens, we lose our place our possession. These papal leaders were angry with John, not because he was preaching heresy. 
John was preaching what he had uncovered in his study of the scriptures, but it spoke against them because they were the ones not following the word of God. And they sought to silence John many times, but God preserved him because God had a plan for him. John says, with whom think you are ye contending with an old man on the brink of the grave? No, you're contending with truth. Truth with is stronger than you. Truth which will overcome you. We're told as we studied in that chapter that God's providence after the death of Pope Gregory, there was a time where there were two popes at the same time. And the one pope over here, God is with me, not with him. And the other pope over here, no, God is with me, not with him. And they fought, they warred against one another. Pope Gregory had his eyes set on terminating John. He passed and we had these two warring popes. God preserving a way while they were fighting. What was John doing? John was studying. John was translating the very word of God so that he can later give it into the hands of the people. Isn't God good? Led by the Holy Spirit, Wycliffe translated the scriptures from Latin to English, placing it into the hands of the common man. At last, the work was completed. The first English translation of the Bible was ever made. The word of God was open to England. The reformer feared not now the prison or the stake. He had placed in the hands of the English people a light which should never be extinguished. In giving the Bible to his countrymen, it says, he had done more to break the fetters, the chains of ignorance and vice that was put on by the very church. He had done more to liberate and to elevate his country than was ever achieved by the most brilliant victories on the field of battle. Giving the word of God to the people is what did that. The character of Whitcliffe is a testimony to the educating, transforming power of the Holy Scriptures. It was the Bible that made him what he was. The effort to grasp the great truths of revelation imparts freshness and vigor to all the faculties. It expands the minds, sharpens the perceptions, ripens the judgment. The study of the Bible, it says, will ennoble every thought, feeling, aspiration as no other study can. It gives stability of purpose, patience, courage, and fortitude. It refines the character and sanctifies the soul. An earnest, reverent study of the scriptures, bringing the mind of the student in direct contact with the infinite mind, would give to the world what? Men of stronger, more active intellect, as well as nobler principle than has ever resulted from the ablest training that human philosophy affords. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 130, the entrance of thy words gives light, it gives understanding. So if you look back through the dark ages, it was the express intent of the adversary, the devil, to hide the word from the people of God to hide the word from the world. Today, it is the express intent of the adversary, the devil, to keep you and I out of the very word of God. 
because the word of God is powerful. It changes. It changes us. Scripture says, by beholding, we become changed. So the adversary doesn't want us to spend time in the word of God. He doesn't want us to spend time contemplating the word of God. Because just as it did for John, just as it did for Martin Luther later on, it liberated them from the chains that they had placed on themselves. The chains that were placed on them by the church. They saw, as they read the word, Christ. The gospel of salvation. Through his study of the Holy Scriptures, Wycliffe understood what we need to remember today. That true liberty comes from knowing God. Psalm 119, 45, 46 says, And I will walk at liberty because I seek thy precepts. Because I'm seeking your precepts, I'm not shackled. It says I'm free. I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings, and I will not be ashamed. This is what John did in his life. And as Matthew read in the scripture reading, it says, Now the Lord is that spirit, and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And I just love this one and says, you shall know the truth. Where do we find truth? For many of people living in the dark ages that were, that were beaten down by the weight that the church had placed on them. Being, feeling that they could not receive forgiveness of sins unless they spent some money or they did this or did that. The words that John were revealing to them from the very scriptures were liberating people. When they know, when they learn the truth, it set them free. And God is still saying that to us today. When you know the truth, the truth will make you free. And if you want to get the cloud line, it says, and whoever the Son of God sets free, they're free indeed. So you want to know the truth. And you want to know the truth, which the Bible says is the Son of God. Because when he sets you free, there's nobody that can shackle you. You're free indeed. The goal of the devil, as always, is to keep you and I in darkness, away from the light of the word of God. The Bible tells us if our gospel is hid, it's hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world, a.k.a. the devil, had blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the gospel, glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. What shall we do to these men? From the story in Acts. For indeed a notable miracle had been done, is manifest to all that dwell in Jerusalem, or we cannot deny it, but that it spread no further among the people, but that it spread no further among the people, but that it spread no further. Let us threaten them that they do not do what? Speak the truth. That's what the devil wants, to suppress truth. The principle for which the disciples stood that day so fearlessly when in answer to the command not to speak any more in the name of Jesus, they, they declared, declared, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. It's the same that the adherents of the gospel, you and I, are uh, in the dark ages, struggled to maintain in the days of the Reformation. This principle we, in our day, are firmly to maintain. The banner of truth and religious liberty held aloft by the founders of the gospel church and by God's witnesses during the centuries that have passed since then has in this last conflict been committed to our hands. The responsibility for this great gift rests with those whom God has blessed with a knowledge of his word. We are to receive this word as the supreme authority 
we are to recognize human government as an ordinance of divine appointment and teach obedience to it as a sacred duty within its legitimate sphere. But when its claims conflict with the claims of God, we must obey who? God rather than man. God's word must be recognized as above all human legislation. A thus set the Lord is not to be set aside for a thus set the church or a thus set the state. We as a people have not accomplished the work which God has committed to us. We are not ready for the issue to which the enforcement of the Sunday law will bring us. It is our duty as we see the signs of approaching peril to arouse to action. Let none of us sit in calm expectation of the evil, comforting ourselves with the belief that this work must go on because prophecy has foretold it and that the Lord will shelter his people. No, we are not doing the will of God if we sit in quietude, doing nothing to preserve liberty of conscience. Fervent, effectual prayer should be ascending to heaven that this calamity may be deferred until we accomplish the work which has so long been neglected. Let that most er be our most earnest prayer. And then let us work in harmony, he says, with our prayers. Martin Luther says the soul can do without everything except the word of God. Jesus himself says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The soul can do without everything, without toys, without electronics, without money. It can do without everything except the word of God, without which none at all of its wants are provided for. Again, he says, one thing, and only one thing is necessary for the Christian life, righteousness and freedom. That one thing is the most holy word of God, the gospel of Christ. Now, for this man to utter these words, you got to understand, if you study his life, he was a monk. He felt he was not good enough. And with his understanding of Christianity then, he sought and did numerous things. He afflicted himself to such degree that he caused himself bodily harm, trying to make himself pleasing to God. And it was not until he was able to get into the word of God that he understood God loves him. God died for him. And the gospel of salvation is freely available, freely available to him and to everyone. Could make him utter these words. The papers had failed to do failed to work their will with Wycliffe during his life because God preserved him. And their hatred could not be satisfied while his body rested in the grave. This is the adversary at work. By a decree of a count, the Council of Constance, more than 40 years after his death, they decreed that his bones be exhumed so that they can be publicly burned to show how much of a heretic this man was. This Brooks says an old white writer had conveyed his ashes that they had collected and they dumped into the Avon. And the ashes went there from the Avon into the Severn. And from the Severn, it went into this narrow, into the narrow seas and from there across the entire world. Thus, the ashes of Wycliffe are the emblem of his doctrine, 
which now is dispersed where? All the world over. Little did his enemies realize the significance of their malicious act. The lesson that I hope to share, the thing that religious liberty, why religious liberty is so important is because it's a revelation of Christ. And the word is what God left. Jesus says in John 5, I believe 39, you search the scriptures thinking that in the word you have everlasting life. The word that you find in the scriptures testify of me, he says. I am come that ye might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. The devil uses sub circumstances in our lives. He uses things that we desire to try to keep our focus off of Christ, to keep our minds away from consuming his word. Because he knows the very moment that we spend time with God in his word, he knows that the very presence of God's word in us brings light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And it's a light onto my path. Without God's word, we have darkness. And for us to stave off the darkness that seemingly continue to envelop this world, we don't need to take God's word and hide it under a bushel. No, the song says. We need to put it up. Sorry. We need to put it up. And when people see the word, if, if Christ says, if I be lifted up, when I lift up the word, I'm lifting up nobody but Christ. And if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. The enemy knows this. And as I showed you in the example, he doesn't want Christ to be lifted up because he doesn't want you to be drawn to Christ. He doesn't want me to be drawn to Christ. Christ says, I came to the world not to condemn the world, but I came to save men. I came to save sinners. He came to save you. And while we have breath in our body, while we have liberty, it is our goal, it is our job to preserve liberty for those following us, to preserve the opportunity, the privilege for, for folks to get into the word of God and not find the false Christ that everybody's portraying everywhere, but find the true Christ as is revealed in his word. The Catholic church, the Roman, the papist says, in, in that time in the past, that you are not capable of interpreting God's words properly. And they use that to wield power over the people. But the Bible says, the greatest gift that God has given you is after he went back, he sent the Holy Spirit. And he says, this Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. He is the comforter, God says, that I, that I gave to you. The earnest of your salvation. So whether or not you went to Andrews, you have some PhDs or, or whatever it is, or you can't understand the big words in the Bible, pray to God and God will decipher it for you. Because his word is not for some, his word is for all. That means his word is for you. His word is for me. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ had made us free. And be not entangled again with any yoke of bondage anyone might be trying to place on you. 
the Lord is that spirit. And if you forget everything that I said today, remember that where the spirit of the Lord is, if you're there with him, you have liberty.